Welcome to UK Business Show, UK's premier business show where we feature business thought leaders, high achievers, and industry experts. Today's episode is brought to you by World Outsourcing Solutions Limited, a company that specializes in helping executive business owners with virtual assistant services and business growth systems. Here's your host, UK Kachidori. Welcome back. Welcome back. So excited that you can join us uh, to the, uh, this program today. Listen, every now and again, we have some outstanding guests that comes here who truly have done it all. Started with nothing, created a successful business and then sell it. And then to lose it a few months later is building it up again. You see, you can learn something from people who've done it, lost it, and are building the gate. And that's why today I've got a very special guest, which I think you're going to like and enjoy. And also you're going to learn quite a bit of things from here. So if you haven't got your diary or your, your journal, you might want to take it out so you can dignify your discovery and be able to write to uh, take action on that. So with me today is my dear friend, uh, Fraser Fanhead, joining us uh, on the show for the first time. Fraser, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here, UK. Thank you. Uh, Awesome. I know a lot of people want to know your number one tip that you've learned over the years <laughs> as well, a business owner. There, there's a lot of them, but I, I would say, although, although you have, you clearly have to work hard as an entrepreneur, you're not going to get anywhere without working hard. But often, I think we get tied into this cycle and entrepreneurs seem to think, especially if they're grown up with a work ethic like I, I was brought up with, that working harder is the solution to every problem what, and what i've learned is working harder is rarely the solution in fact it's often part of the problem and can lead to you you know lack of creativity burnout stress anxiety and depression and all those sorts of things and that's something that i have very much learned on on my journey so what should people do instead well, they need to do the right things and do them in the right way. So they really need to take an assessment of what they're, they're doing in their business, um, look to eliminate pretty much everything they can or delegate everything they can and just focus on those activities that are important in driving their business forward. Um, because you can never do everything. And I, certainly with my clients, I've noticed that they're building a business up they do have a tendency to try and do everything they have a fear of delegation they feel responsibility to their early clients to be the the contact person and it's just impossible if you're going to scale a business you will drive yourself into the ground so you have to learn to eliminate non-essential activities delegate everything else and then implement um what's called the ivy lee method um, which is a hundred year old method um, that I use in several of my businesses to build them up that just turns you into a very, very highly productive business owner that is constantly driving the business in the right direction. You know, the beautiful thing about what you've just shared with us right there is if you can identify what are the right things to do and how to do that, it means you have an equal opportunity to be as successful as anybody else because success leaves clues. And if you can identify what makes a successful business a success and do that in a smart way, oh my goodness, it doesn't matter where you come from, where you are based, what type of industry you're in, you will get success. So I'm super excited about talking more about this uh, subject. But before we dive deep into our conversation here today, friends, I know you've got an interesting uh, uh, journey. You started uh, in this journey of entrepreneurship at the age of 13 and then went on to uh, create a 2.2 uh, million uh, pound sell, uh, you know, when you sold your business. Tell us about that journey very briefly. Very briefly. Well, um, an uncle gave me a book about magic when I was about 12 or 13 and I got very into magic. I started subscribing to magic magazines, visiting professional magic shops, and I started doing children's parties at the age of 13. And when most kids my age were getting like a five or a week in pocket money, if they were lucky, I was earning a hundred pounds in an afternoon, often doing Saturday and Sunday afternoons and making 200 pounds a week as a 13 year old. And do you know what? I, I, I loved it. Um, I, I gave up doing magic for 
reasons I, I really, really regret now, although I, I might might have turned into the next Dynamo or David Blaine, <laughs> who knows. But yeah, that, that was um, my first entrepreneurial um, endeavour. I then used to hire nightclubs like the Hacienda in Manchester or the Warehouse in Leeds and run club nights um, that supported my way through university. Um, then I became a music lawyer. I went to a very academic school and pretty much everyone became a doctor, dentist, lawyer, or if they, they weren't too bright, an accountant. That's a joke, by the way. Sorry, any accountants watching, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> Um, so I became a lawyer and primarily I fooled myself. I didn't really have any affinity with the law. Truth be told, I, I could just do it reasonably easily. And I kind of told myself it was a way to get into film production because I've, I've always loved films and I, I wanted to be a film producer. Um, I did end up going to the music industry. I went up into the entertainment industry, but somehow got sidetracked into the music industry instead of me and um, worked in London for six or seven years as a lawyer in the in the music industry. Finally kind of saw sense and realized that that wasn't for me. Um, kind of knew it really, but I think one conversation with my boss um, kind of hit the nail on the head for me. We'd, we'd had this meeting with a band who I ended up managing, but um, he basically said at the end of that meeting, I, I told this band that I loved their new album. And at the end of the meeting, my boss goes, um, Fraser, love isn't a word that lawyers use. <laughs> I don't know why, it's just one of those insignificant little comments that just, just kind of encapsulated everything for me about what was wrong about what I was doing. Because I didn't love what I was doing. Um, I wanted to do something I felt passionate about. And if I couldn't feel passionate about it, what, what was the point? I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing documents and management agreements and recording agreements and producer agreements for other people. So I decided I, I would go back to doing what I love doing, working for myself, coming up with new ideas, getting companies off the ground. And that's pretty much what I've done for the past 22 years. Yes, I know. And you then went into property, uh, which led to you, you know, creating enormous wealth in a relatively short time. It's funny, I don't regard two and a half million quid as enormous wealth anymore. I did at the time, to be honest, but it's, it's funny how your perspective changed. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny, really, after kind of not going into the family business, which was property and going to London and having this glamorous career in the music industry, coming back and then starting a kind of 21st century um, property business, which is kind of an online property consultancy. Um, I started that, I built, used internet marketing techniques to build up a database of 11,000 property investors um, very quickly and sold about 60 million quid's worth of um, new build property online in, in the space of two years and won um, a couple of awards for being a property entrepreneur and what have you, and was approached by two different companies who wanted to buy the business. And after some umming and ahhing, I, I decided, yeah, the time was right. And I sold it two years after starting it for, um, I think it was 2.25 2 million pounds was the figure we eventually agreed on. So yeah, yeah it's, I was, um, I was quite, I got, Let's put it this way, I got a bit too big for my boots and <laughs> thought it was a bit too clever at that stage, which uh, came back to bite me, the truth be told. <laughs> and because you ended up uh, sort of uh, uh, getting into a situation where your overheads were, was, were so much higher than your income and within 18 months, you found yourself in a, some tricky position. Do share that a bit. Yeah, it's it went through a very, very tough time. I mean, I, I went from selling that company for two and a quarter million. Um, then the financial crisis hit in 2008, and I, I'd actually gone to work as CEO for the, the, the company that bought my company. So I was working there as CEO. They decided to close the company because of the, the financial crash, which particularly affected the property business. And in a very short space of time, I found myself with um, no income. Um, I'd been rather cavalier with my, my money. Um, kind of thinking, oh, it was easy come, easy go, easy to make again. Um, lost a lot of it through bad investments, lending it to so-called friends who never paid it back. And um, yeah, just had very high overheads and very, it's amazing how quickly you can go through a large sum of money. And within, within the space of about 18 months, I think it was, 
literally couldn't afford to pay the electricity bills and oh. had to borrow money off my mother. And was, we were living off baked beans and baked potatoes and other baked goods. <laughs> and um, it was, you know, for two or three years, it was, it was very, very um, tough. It, it, it really was, but I managed to avoid kind of going into um, kind of bankruptcy and yeah. you know, pick, myself, pick myself up and, you know, you've, you've, it take, you take, take a blow to your confidence, but you have to pick yourself up and, and move on because you don't have you, really any other sensible choice. You do. You and I were talking earlier on about, you know, the reason why perhaps, you know, you lost that amount of money, which had to do with the money mindset. Do you mm. mind sharing a little bit about that with our listeners? No, not at all. But I think, I think it's crucial. I think I, I shared with you, so it's sort of analogous to the way you hear about these lottery winners who win tens and tens of millions of pounds, but then they're not happy. And within two or three years, they've lost it all and often gone bankrupt. And to, to a lesser extent, that sort of attitude affected me. We, we are all affected by our parents' attitudes. You know, we've all heard things growing up like, oh, money doesn't grow on trees, or you can't afford that, you don't deserve that, or the, these, that's only for rich people, or rich people are evil, you know, all these sorts of nonsense. But it infects your mind. And my personal perspective, um, my father is, um, as I said, <laughs> to be kind very careful with his money and always has been and you know I suppose I rebelled against that because I didn't like his attitude towards money so I I became I think overly cavalier yeah with with my attitude towards money as a compensation for that I, I often think everyone's faults in life are stems from overcompensating for insecurities or things bad thing things that don't feel good about themselves but yeah I, I i i basically thought that money looking back on it i thought christ i've, I've made two and a half million quid 2.25 million quid not to exaggerate in um in just two years I, I fundamentally didn't believe i deserved it and therefore divested myself of it in one way or another yeah yeah, you know, that's why we talk on the show regularly how important it is to constantly review your beliefs around money, because if your beliefs around money or anything for that matter is not uh, correct, you end up spending a lot of energy and lose it all at the same time, which, you know, it does not help anybody because some people end up with a lot of money, but they lose on quantity relationship with their family or loved ones, uh, which again is not wealthy. Wealth is all around, is having it all, being able to be a force for good at the time when you need to do. But there's a key things that you have come to understand as perhaps uh, crucial to any business owners in our audience today, uh, if they want to be truly successful, one of the things that you and I agree on is having a, you know, not just a business for the purpose of making money, but you know, wanting to thrive for a higher power, I mean, for something higher, something greater. Would you talk to us about that briefly? Yeah, I've, I've started a number of businesses over the past 22 years. Um, some have been very successful and some, some not. And there have been times where I've started businesses just because, yeah, I needed the money. I yeah. um, thought they were a good money making opportunity. And I also see friends do this, friends who have inherited family businesses or they just go into things. And I've really come to realize it's just not a recipe for success. If That's right. If, if you believe success is more, as you've just intimated, more than just making money, it's about holistic things, about having your health, being fulfilled with what you do, having a happy family life. If you just start a business purely to make money, I would wager you're, you're, you're going to be unmotivated and generally unhappy and feel unfulfilled. Now, I'm not criticizing anyone for doing that. I, I've done it myself. I understand financial necessity. Um, may they force you to do that but I really believe if you're if you're you've got a business and you're not in it's not in alignment with your personal values it is not a recipe for success now when I started my last company um, which I started in sort of 2011 2012 you know I, I built that to a valuation of 30 million pounds um, and when I started it, I had 
a really, really powerful, strong vision that I thoroughly believed in. Um, given my previous experience, which was in property, this was a crowd, a property crowdfunding company, the world's first property crowdfunding company. Um, and I wanted people to in, cut out the banks, invest together and share the profits together. Oh, yeah, I now, remember this story. Yes, yeah. And you had some people who thought it, it couldn't be done and uh, you kept on going. I love that story. Do share with everybody. Well, there's a lot of financial regulations, as people know, and crowdfunding was in its infancy. There were a few companies like Kickstarter, um, Funding Circle and Zopa were around at that time. They, they really inspired me to take their model and transfer it to the property market. But for, I think, six or seven months of going around and visiting various lawyers, I was told time and time again, it contravened the Financial Services, Financial Markets and Services Act, the Financial yeah. Services and Markets Act, wherever it is. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was basically illegal. It was a, an, an unregulated collective investment scheme. Um, but eventually I, I looked into the you know, legal background. I looked into the law myself and I found there were certain exceptions within that act that would enable us to grow, well, certainly start this business and grow it to a certain level. Um, by appealing to a common interest group was was the exception so we did that and it went really well for a few years but then more companies came into the area the industry got regulated we had to change our business model we were forced to but virtually by the fca and it became much more a peer-to-peer -peer lending model and that you know we became glorified money lenders and that that just didn't sit well with me at all um, and for, I think for the next four or five years, I, I just hated what the company had become. And yeah, I was CEO. We had a, up to, um, we had about eight and 900 shareholders. Um, we had, we were looking after 130 million pounds worth of client money. So I kind of felt trapped. This business that I'd created was now something I hated running and I, I struggled to get out of it. And it was only through kind of being mentored by Bob Proctor um, and realizing that, you know, there, there, there were other things I could do and I had, I owed a duty to myself to do something that I loved doing, something that would wait, make me wake up and feel excited about the day ahead rather than getting that kind of lurching sick kind of <laughs> back to school in September feeling that I was getting every day going to work. Um, I realized I had to find a way to get out of it. So I did, I created a plan and it didn't turn out as I expected. Um, well, that's perhaps a conversation for another time, but I did get out of that business about 18 months ago and have been focused on doing my business success coaching um, with other entrepreneurs who I, I now help to build their businesses. And you know, that gives me a real sense of fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that you and I talked about, uh, what entrepreneurs often do is uh, they create business with the uh, expectation that it is going to become an income generator and everything's going to be okay. And they find themselves that they've created another job for themselves like yourself. Uh, but you have now discovered that there is a different way, a better way, where you can create uh, these new businesses, literally, uh, you know, and create a future for yourself, but without being tied into it. I'd love to hear maybe one or two strategies you've discovered, uh, perhaps, that absolutely works, you know, if applied properly, that it can help entrepreneurs today. Well, I think... I think just going back to that first point, having a purpose for what you're doing, something that's bigger than yourself, that inspires you to get up and go to work every day, that inspires your staff to go and do, and do things. Now, that can be as simple as just looking at what you're already doing and changing your perspective on it. So I often, um, as a, okay, so take, take for a very simple example. If you're a janitor in a school, for example, you're working for a school, now you, you could take the viewpoint that you've got some shit job that you're just cleaning up after messy, annoying children, that everything's a grind. Or you could take the view that you are providing a safe, clean environment so that children can learn as well as they possibly can. And that change of perspective can That's give right. you a purpose in life. Um, but really, I think you have to start off. If you're going to build a business that you really believe in, you have to understand what your own 
values are in life. And I don't think I don't think many people have really ever sat down and think like this is what I believe in. I believe in integrity. I believe in loyalty. I believe in justice. I believe in moderation or learning or wisdom. I don't know. Whatever your values are, you have to figure them out and be true to you, true to them, and build your business around them. Yeah. Um, and I think myself included. I mean. I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I, I, other people have always regarded me as being very smart. And I, I thought for a long time that was enough to get me by and be successful. And it's not, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you've got behind you, how smart you are, how hard you work. Um, the key to any success in any business or any endeavor is developing the right habits. That's right. It's, it's that simple. You do the right, and these are things that they're very easy to do or very easy not to do, but you have to make the decision to do them and you do them day in and day out. And I think it was Albert Gray who said that um, the difference between successful people and, and failures is successful people do those things that the failures don't do. And it doesn't mean they enjoy doing them. I mean, take an example of, you know, going to a gym, which I, I do do a couple of times a week. I don't like it, but I force myself to do it. The, the reason some people have great bodies is not that they love lifting weights, but they have a goal and they want to achieve it. And they have a, presumably a good enough reason why. So they carry on doing it and they're dedicated to, to it. And that's what makes them different. And the same in business. You need to have that, going back to my first point, you need to have that higher purpose because it gives you a reason why you get up in the morning, why you will push on through and overcome obstacles um, and put up with all the difficulties that running your own business inevitably entails. So that's why having a purpose is so important. Because if you're just in it for the money, you're going to get deterred and look for some shiny new thing or switch businesses and you won't persevere and you will never reach your goals so that's why the purpose is important and you reach your purpose by setting goals and working towards them progressively by doing the right things day in and day out consistently absolutely there's so much in there that you've packed in that uh, sentence man i appreciate that we're coming towards the end of our time here together uh, and i uh, would love for you to share with our audience where can, people can find you and maybe learn uh, more from you yeah certainly um i mean the big thing that the the, the kind of foundation of everything i I do. There's a lot of business development stuff there as well. But fundamentally, I believe that mindset is the foundation of your success. It's probably 80% or more the foundation of your success. So that's, that's what I help people with. Um, my, my website is bluesilver.solutions. If they want to visit my podcast, um, it's available on all the usual channels. It's called the Spiritual Entrepreneur Blueprint. And it's for people who are kind of spiritually aware and conscious of the need um kind of aware of the laws of the universe and that if you work in conjunction with the laws you will be much more successful and then on linkedin it's just linkedin.com and my name fraser fernhead f-r-a-z-e-r fernhead f-e-a-r-n-h-e-a-d awesome awesome there you have it ladies and gentlemen if you want to learn more around business and you want to discover how other people are doing it uh, you have somebody here who's done it lost some of it and is now doing and building business on purpose uh, fraser fan had you know where to find uh, him uh, just click the link below and you'll be taken straight to the website alternatively you can reach out to the team and we'll be able to help you Fraser, one final uh, thought from you. One thing that you wish all entrepreneurs know about money. So, what was it? One thing that all entrepreneurs know about money. Um, you must know about money. It's just energy. It's it only has, whatever meaning it has is only what you attach to it. Um, don't get don't get hung up on it, and don't work for money. Work to grow as a person work to deliver value to other people and the money will follow. Wow. 
<laughs> love that. Absolutely love that. That has to be the caption for this uh, audio, you know, work to increase your value. I, I absolutely love that. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Fraser, for being here with us today. And we certainly would love to have you back on the show one of these days and maybe talk more about uh, the same topic or even how you can claim your place uh, among the giants of who are making the contribution in the world today as leaders in business or in whatever field they may be. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, Bill, and uh, everybody in our audience today. If you've got any question, uh, reach out to our team or reach out to, to Fraser uh, using the links below this recording. And until next time, always remember to live well, live with passion, and know that the best is truly, truly yet to come. Goodbye for now. Thank you for listening to Ukai Business Show. We will be back to bring you more episodes with success stories and advice straight from the experts. Want more? Check out www.ukaibusinessshow.com. Get your free trial of our virtual assistance service today. Just visit www.worldoutsourcingsolutions.com. Quote WOS18 or send us an email at support at worldoutsourcingsolutions.com. 